You are listening to Perplexity. Is it possible to glimpse into the future? Since the beginning of time, the world has been filled with mysteries. And within those mysteries are countless unexplained experiences, often labeled as being paranormal or unexplained. One of the most common arguments with paranormal experiences is that they stem back to some type of connection between the human mind and our universe. Call it sixth sense, ESP, precognition, psychic abilities. These concepts are common vocabulary in this genre. Premonition refers to the supposed ability to gain insight or forewarning about a future event through extrasensory means without any apparent cause or logical explanation. Premonitions can manifest themselves in various forms like vivid dreams, visions, intuitive feelings, or unexplained sensations, and these are believed to foreshadow a future occurrence. It seems like premonitions often come out of traumatic events. So you have this vision that something's going to happen, and then soon after there's a big tragedy like a fire or a death. Skeptics argue premonitions could be coincidence, selective memory, and the human tendency to find chance, confirmation bias, or self-delusion. But just like any unexplained phenomena, there will always be skeptics. There's always going to be scientists trying to find some sort of concrete way to explain things that may not be explainable or tangible. So could premonitions tie to something greater? In the words of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, quote, We are not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. In this episode, we will be discussing the concepts of premonition and psychic ability. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a Mystery Podcast. As always, I am your host, Kadra, and if you're new here, hello and welcome. I tell tales every single week that have perplexed me. So if you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, don't worry, you're in the right place. And if you end up enjoying today's episode, I would love it so much if you follow along. And if you are a returning listener, hello, my friends, welcome back. So happy you're here. I have a really interesting, cool story for you guys today. It's a big concept, as you heard in the intro. So I'm going to try to give you as good of a summary as I can. And we'll also get into some really cool encounter stories about premonitions. But first, very quickly, a couple announcements as always. I have a live show coming up. We're going to do Q&As, listener stories, and giveaways. So save the date, Saturday, July 13th, 8 p.m. Central. It's going to be on YouTube Live, and I will post that link on Instagram and socials. So don't forget, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited. And if you have questions or listener stories, be sure to be sending those in so I can be compiling all of that at perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. Also, don't forget, I have made some new additions to the Patreon. There's two new tiers, and there's lots of good content on there. So get on there, check it out. I am just starting a new four-part series, and it is about shiny, happy people. I think that's what it's called. Um, I haven't recorded the episodes yet, but they'll be out by the time this episode comes out. Uh, it's the documentary on Prime about the Duggar family, the crazy reality TV family from the 2000s that had 19 kids. It's wild. I didn't know a whole lot about the Duggars and it's uh, it's really crazy. So be sure to check that out along with the over 20 bonus episodes on there. I would love to have you on the Patreon. Don't forget there's a merch sale going on as well. I have some new merch that just came out too. There's some hats on there now. And then there's like a new tie dye pattern for some of the shirts. Uh, there's a new design for the mugs, so go check all of that out on Bonfire. That link is in the episode description. And on select items, there is a summer sale, so you can co use the code SUMMER15 at checkout to get 15% off of your order. Sources that were used for today's episode will be down in the show notes, so be sure to check those out if you want to learn more. 
And as always, trigger warning for today, this podcast is not for children. We will be discussing some content that could be considered disturbing to some listeners. So listener discretion is advised. So without further ado, let's get into this episode all about premonitions, precognition, and psychic ability. So as I stated in the introduction, there's a lot of different terminologies that people use when they're talking about this concept. There's also intuition, gut instinct, etc. There's just there's a ton of overlap. I'll be using a lot of terms interchangeably throughout this episode, so just keep that in mind, but I just want you to be thinking of that concept of like predicting something and then it happening later. The word precognition comes from the Latin pre, that means before, and cognitio, meaning acquiring knowledge. It's also known as a future vision or future sight, and it's when a person claims to have the ability to see into the future. According to Psychology Today, it's believed that one third of Americans have experienced precognition, so I thought that was pretty cool. I feel like this could also closely overlap with deja vu, but deja vu is that feeling that something's already happened, but I'm wondering now if there's some similarities with like the science behind this. I have deja vu on my list to cover later. So the earliest known record of psychic abilities came from ancient civilizations like Egypt, Greece, China. And within these societies, people would demonstrate psychic abilities sometimes, and they were often worshipped, looked up to. But in the European ages, as we got into like, I would say the 15th century through maybe the uh, like 18th century, maybe even 19th, these things were demonized. You know, we had the Salem witch trials, people started to feel like they had to hide these abilities and not really be able to talk about them. But all of that being said, reports of these things have been going on since the beginning of time, basically. In Greece, people who had this ability were considered to be strong spiritual leaders. One example of this would be the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle was said to receive messages from the god Apollo, and her prophecies were highly valued by kings, generals, and other powerful figures. In ancient China, psychics were also highly respected and often served as advisors to the imperial court. There's also the famous story of the Joan of Arc, who had a lot of visions and premonitions about what they needed to do to win the war. She claimed that she could talk to God and get messages from him. Psychics back in this time period were often called diviners, and they used a variety of tools and techniques to predict the future, including astrology, numerology, and the interpretation of dreams. And that's definitely something that I've read about in the Bible before, people who would advise these kings and interpret their dreams, kind of guide them on what to do and help them make really important decisions. It's also commonly reported by people who claim to have experienced a premonition that it occurred in a dream. Aristotle was said to have studied prophecy on divination and sleep, and he believed that these dreams were, quote, tokens and causes of future events, end quote. The term precognition, though, first appeared in the 17th century, and it didn't come into common use among investigators until much later, so it's a, a newer term. An early investigation into claims of precognition was published by the missionary F.R.P. Boylat in 1883. He claimed that he met with an African witch doctor, and he was skeptical of this person's abilities. So he asked a question to the witch doctor, but silently with his mind. And Boylat was very surprised when the witch doctor answered him out loud and answered the question correctly. By the 20th century, J.W. Dune, or Dunn, D-U-N-N-E, a British soldier and aeronautics engineer, would explain what he considered to be several precognitive dreams that he had experienced. 
He decided after this encounter, he was going to start doing some experiments and he was going to just try to keep track of what he was experiencing in these dreams. So he devised this method to record his dreams and he would keep track of whether or not these dreamed events would end up happening in real life or not. He ended up publishing these findings in a book that was titled An Experiment with Time. And later on, he stated that at least 10% of his dreams were precognitive, meaning that they came true later. But whether or not 10% is significant, I'm not sure. Carl Jung, the father of modern psychotherapy, also reported several precognitive dreams and experiences. Most notable was in the year of 1914. During this time, Jung claimed that he saw a vision of a darkened Europe, and he later believed that this was a foreshadowing or a vision of what would happen in World War I. He was a major contributor to the development and understanding of dreams and how they may be providing us with clues that lead to greater inner awareness. According to PsychicSchool.com, there's also several different types of precognition, implicit learning, energetic communication, and non-local intuition. So I'm just going to briefly explain what each of these are. So implicit learning refers to the ability when our subconscious mind draws upon previous experiences and creates a sequence or a pattern of what is about to happen before it occurs. So some everyday examples of this would be when you know the notes or lyrics that come next in a song, not because you've ever heard the song before, but based on previous knowledge about maybe what they're talking about, or maybe the melody is similar to one you've heard before. Energetic communication is an animal or a human's ability to sense what's about to happen right before. An example could be when animals sense the energies from the earth, that an earthquake or tsunami is about to happen, and they react by fleeing just before the event. Another example could be when you have an intuition that someone is thinking about you or staring at you. And I always just thought this was like, I don't know, natural, normal, biological things that we have. And it very well could be, but it's interesting that they're labeling it as a type of precognition. I've never heard of energetic communication before. Non-local intuition is when siblings, for example, know that something will happen even when the other sibling lives across the country. Parents can sense if something's happened to their child when they're not with them, or when someone knows that a loved one has passed away just before being told. And these types of precognitions and premonitions came up a lot in the encounter stories that I was looking at. This is known as a state of quantum entanglement, where time and space are not a factor, and therefore it's possible to be connected to someone across vast distances. This definitely has a lot of parallels to twin telepathy, the episode that I did about twin telepathy and doppelgangers, very similar. There are also some famous examples that I found among hundreds, if not thousands, of precognition. And these included stories from Helena Blavatsky, Edgar Case, John Barker, Abraham Lincoln, and people connected to the famous ship, the Titanic. So Helena Blavatsky, she lived from 1831 to 1891, and this was a Russian spiritualist and philosopher. She made claims she had a vision of the theory of relativity, predicting the photon and explaining the phenomenon and its photoelectric effect. Edgar Case, who lived from 1877 to 1945, was an American that claimed to be clairvoyant and he seemed to have psychic abilities. Case would give information on a person's health, and he would seemingly predict future events. A lot of his work was done in a trance-like state where he would be sleeping and he would start to speak while an assistant would transcribe the information. He also claimed that he would have dreams that included precognition of future events and retrocognition, which was dreams of different periods in history. Psychiatrist John Barker was also a significant person that came up looking into these precognition experiences. 
1966 in South Wales, 150 children and adults were tragically killed when waste from a coal mine buried a school in what became known as the Aberfan landslide. Barker ended up visiting the town after this happened, and while he was there, he basically interviewed a bunch of different residents who claimed that they had experienced premonitions that a disaster was going to happen there. Later on, Barker also discovered that several of the children who ended up dying in the landslide had experienced vivid precognitive dreams where they had premonitions that they were going to die soon. President Abraham Lincoln, there's also a lot of stories about him and how he knew he was going to die. Two weeks before his assassination, Lincoln recounted to his family a dream. He told his wife, his friends, that he was walking through the White House in this dream when he came into the East Room and he saw his corpse lying there. This room would later be the exact location where his body would be laid after he had been shot and murdered. And then, of course, there was the Titanic. In 1912, the Titanic was about to set sail across the Atlantic Ocean on its maiden voyage. After the devastating events that we know, where the ship would sink, killing over 1,500 people, others would come forward. Family members that knew people on the ship, people in the area, and they would claim that they had seen the ship crash in their dreams. In some cases, people who were supposed to board the Titanic would have these premonitions and they would cancel their tickets. There's also the very infamous story of the Lindbergh baby. Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., a 20-month-old boy who was the son of a famous aviator and Anne Moreau Lindbergh, was kidnapped in 1932. This was on March 1st at about 9 p.m. He was taken from his nursery on the second floor of the Lindbergh home in Hopewell, New Jersey. The child's absence was discovered. This was all reported to the parents by the nurse. They were all at home when this happened. The nurse's name was Betty Gow. There was this big investigation. And during this time, there were some psychologists, Henry Murray and D.R. Wheeler. They ended up using all of this to test for dream precognition. They invited the public to report any dreams that they were having of the child. A total of 1,300 dreams were reported, but only 5% envisioned the child to be dead, and only 4 of those 1,300 would report the location of the child's grave amongst the trees. And on May 12, 1932, the body of the kidnapped baby was accidentally found, partially buried, and badly decomposed. This was about four and a half miles southeast of the Lindbergh home, 45 feet from the highway near Mount Rose, New Jersey, and Mercer County. The discovery was made by a man named William Allen, an assistant on a truck driven by Orville Wilson. The head of the baby was crushed, and there was a hole in the skull. There were also some body parts missing. The body was later positively identified to be Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., and he was cremated at Trenton, New Jersey on May 13th, 1932. The coroner's examination showed that the child had been dead for about two months and that the death was caused by a blow to the head. So he was found dead amongst the trees, but very, very few people of the 1300 dream reports would accurately report what happened to the baby. But I'm also like, you know, this could be a spiritual gift. Like not everybody is psychic, so I wouldn't expect everybody to get it right. So before we get into encounter stories, one more thing I want to mention is that in 1965, G.W. Lambert, a formal council member of the Society for Cyclical Research, or SPR, proposed that there are five criteria that need to be met before an account of a precognitive dream can be seen as credible five things to keep in mind as we get into some encounters. The first being the dream should be reported to a credible witness before the event. The second being the time interval between the dream and the event should be short. The third being the event should be unexpected at the time of the dream. 
The fourth being that the description should be of an event destined literally and not symbolically to happen. And the fifth criteria being the details of the dream and event should tally. So now let's get into some encounters. I found these in a BuzzFeed article by Hannah Dubrovgos, and they're all pretty short. A bunch of them are anonymous, but if they do have a name, I will read the name at the end. So this first one is the most intense premonition I've ever had was also the one with the shortest amount of time between the premonition and the actual occurrence. I had gone to bed on the night of Wednesday, November 1st, 2017, like any other night. However, into the early hours the next day, Thursday, November 2nd, 2017, between 4 and 5 a.m., I had a disturbing premonition. My older brother's car was parked in our parents' driveway. It was not moving, but the car had been turned on, and only his four children were sitting in the vehicle. Right off the bat, it was odd, because they were behaving as if they were on the road. It looked like they were all playing pretend. They were playing around and goofing off, as they usually do, but instead of going up to the vehicle happy to see them, because I hadn't seen them for weeks, I walked up to the outside of the car, very concerned. I began banging on the windows of the right side of the vehicle, specifically the back passenger side of the car. I was aggressively banging on the windows, asking if the children would please get out of the car. They became aware of me, but kept on with their casual, silly behavior. The eldest child said he didn't want to come out, but the second oldest leaned over the youngest child to look at me through the window and agreed to come out. Before they could exit the vehicle, my dream quickly shifted. I was now standing in the middle of an unknown road, hugging a housekeeper that I had grown up with. She was an extremely sweet woman from a much older generation, but in the dream, she was stronger than ever. Her spirit and physical form were enhanced, which I thought was odd. After the hug, I abruptly awoke from my dream. Although the hugging moment and the second sequence of the dream was sweet, I was still very concerned for my brother and his children. So at 8.30 a.m., I texted him and told him the strange dream in detail. He immediately replied back, informing me that his children had just gotten into a car wreck that morning, riding with their mother on the way to school. The car had been totaled, and the youngest child had received a bloody nose, but there was no other physical damage. I believe the housekeeper had a purpose in the dream, and my hug was a thanks to her for watching over my family that day. End quote. And that one is from Gosh J. But the rest of the stories I'll be reading are anonymous. So this next one is short, and here it goes. I had the same dream over and over. A psychic once told me that I was from the days of Atlantis in one life, and in another, I burned up as a little girl. Driving to Sacramento, I saw the house that I had been dreaming about. I stopped, and it turned out that an older woman and man lived there. I explained that I had been seeing this house in my dreams. They showed it to me. I did not know how or when, but I had been in that house and played on those stairs. My parents had never even been to that town. The people told me that their little girl died in a fire at six years old. I haven't had another dream about the house now that I've seen it. End quote. This next story is also short. When I was in middle school, I had a dream in which I was sitting in an empty classroom with a test that had already been filled out. I looked through the test at the answers. Then I woke up. About a week later, we were given that exact test in class. I finished the test in about five minutes. I double-checked all the answers because I recognized them from the dream. But I wasn't sure that what I remembered was right. It turns out that the test in the dream was exactly right. I got a 100. The teacher even asked how I had finished it so quickly. Unfortunately, I can't remember her reaction when I explained that I had seen it in a dream. End quote. This next one is about meditating. So they say, I used to meditate a lot. 
a lot, a lot. I started for 20 minutes a day, which progressed to 30 minutes, then to an hour a day. Soon I was meditating two hours twice a day and sometimes all day. Well, after about four months of this, I started having deja vu a lot. One day it was very creepy. I had deja vu for like two or three minutes straight and I predicted everything that was going to happen before it did happen. For example, sitting in the living room with no view of the kitchen, I predicted my mother in the kitchen would drop something. Then I predicted my dad and brother walking in while my dad laughed at the joke that my brother told him. I predicted my sister walking out of her room to tell us something cool and a few other things. It was extremely creepy. I stopped meditating after that. End quote. This next story starts off. About 20 years ago, I had a very realistic dream, which is already out of the norm for me. In my dream, my brother, who was just two years older than I was, was dead somehow. We knew he was dead for sure, but nobody knew where he was located. It was so real to me that I woke up crying uncontrollably. I had never before and have never experienced anything like it since. Well, that morning, I couldn't wait to call my brother and make sure he was okay. I called him just to hear that he couldn't wait to tell me what had just happened to him the night before. We live in Ohio, close to Lake Erie. When the weather's cold enough, the rivers feeding the lake will freeze, making a nice route to ride snowmobiles and four-wheelers on the ice. But we never ride alone. My brother decided to go down and try to meet up with someone to ride with. He did, and they rode for a few hours before they decided to get a beer at a local bar. Having not traveled there together, they separated and made plans to meet at the bar. The other rider took off, leaving my brother alone on the ice. Just as he was approaching the edge, the ice broke. He could feel the water under the ice pulling him down. His snowmobile still running, hung by the skis on the edge of the hole and the ice. With all his might, he was able to pull himself onto the ice and crawl to his truck, soaked and frozen. Sensing something was wrong, the other rider came back to see my brother's sled hung on a hole in the ice and assumed he had fallen through and was under the ice on his way to the lake. But as he got closer, he saw my brother in his truck trying to get warm. The guy was able to pull my brother's sled out of the ice using his sled and a rope. He loaded it for him and sent him on his way. <laughs> Never knew his name. Had my brother fallen through the ice, we would have known he was dead, but we wouldn't have been able to find his body until the spring thaw. End quote. Just so crazy. It's interesting because I, I picked these out thinking they would be good, but I hadn't fully read them. And I mentioned earlier that it seems like this has overlaps to deja vu and some of the stories reference deja vu, like the meditation one. And this next one also mentions deja vu. So they say, when I was in my late teens, I had a dream that I was in a car wreck with my biological father. I didn't actually meet him until I was 21. In this dream, we were taking a left at an intersection when a blue Suburban sped through the red light, hit us, and rolled our vehicle over, killing us. So a few months after I met my biological father, we were working on a friend's vehicle and heading home. We got to an intersection, and I got deja vu. I remembered the dream. I immediately asked my father to stop. I told him that we forgot some tools, so we needed to go back and turn around. As he did this, we saw a blue Suburban plow through the intersection, and I knew it would have hit us just like in my dream. This occurred four or five years after my dream. I've had other dreams like this, and I keep an eye out for these events to happen. The dreams are very realistic and vivid. You don't forget them after you have them. You can feel the air on your skin, the pain you're in, and so forth. I call it deja vu, but it's more realistic than that when the moment is upon you. End quote. This next one is also a premonition from a dream, 
and they say, I had a dream where all I could see was white clouds filled with black spots. I woke up in a cold sweat and sat straight up in bed. My wife asked me what was wrong, and I told her about the dream. I told her I didn't know what it was, but it made me feel uneasy. Five days after my dream, I had to go to my landlord's house because he was not answering calls, and I knew that that was not like him. I knocked on his front door and noticed the lights were on in the house, making me think he was home. There was no answer after I knocked, so I went around the house to the driveway where his truck was parked. Making my way to the front, I came to a corner window of the house. The window was covered by white blinds that were closed and covered with flies. This still gives me chills to this day. Needless to say, my landlord was home. I've watched enough true crime shows to know I had to call and report a deceased person. There was a reason I had that dream. Someone wanted to prepare me for that day. I wasn't prepared, but the dream's meaning was instantly seared into my memory for as long as I live." End quote. So this final encounter story is also anonymous, and they say, I was a young mother and was fortunate to have a wonderful babysitter about a half mile from my job. Out of the blue, I started having significant anxiety. I couldn't sleep or calm down. I had a foreboding feeling that I couldn't shake. After two days of extreme anxiety, I walked by a coworker at the office and said, something bad is going to happen. He told me to stop as my anxiety was making him uncomfortable and scared. <laughs> relatable. <laughs> At the same time, my coworker was expressing his wishes to me. I heard an ambulance with sirens screaming. Everything in my body went limp as I was sure the ambulance was heading to the babysitters. At the same time the ambulance went rushing by, a call came to the office saying that there was an emergency at the babysitters, which confirmed my worst fear. I jumped in my car and sped to the babysitters. I flew up the entry stairs and through the front door. I saw the paramedics working on someone in a room off the kitchen. Panic and fear rocked me to my core, as I was sure my premonition had warned me about my son. Sadly, a baby girl had died of crib death. Although it wasn't my son, I will never forget that day. The extreme sadness felt for the family who lost their daughter and the life-changing relief seeing my little boy asking to be picked up from his crib, end quote. So I guess this was like a group babysitting thing. And it also makes me wonder if like maybe in another universe or in another situation, maybe it would have been her son that would have passed, but then she had this dream and maybe there was some little butterfly effect that caused it to be this other family's daughter that passed. That's so crazy. So like I said, a lot of these tie to traumatic events. The concept of predicting future events remains a mystery, with some people theorizing it's only coincidence, some form of selective memory, or even a hoax. In the scientific community, one term that is used is quantum entanglement, nicknamed Spooky Action at a Distance by Albert Einstein, which describes a proven phenomena of two spatially separated particles that influence each other, even over large distances. While the phenomenon is subatomic, some academics have theorized that quantum entanglement could explain phenomena like telepathy and psychokinesis. But could this have something to do with the brain? Tyler Henry, a famous modern-day psychic, has performed experiments with neuroscientists, being hooked up to wires and allowing them to map and monitor his brain waves while doing psychic readings. Their findings were remarkable. His brain waves showed that he was going in and out of consciousness. When he seemed to be receiving information from the other side, his brain waves changed into a pattern that would indicate he was sleeping all the while being fully awake, animated, and having a conversation with his client. In 2013, while working at the University of Missouri, Jeff Tarrant, PhD, would have a life-changing experience. 
after he met a woman named Janet Mayer. One of his research assistants announced that he wanted to tell Jeff Tarrant about his mother, Janet Mayer. According to this person, his mother Janet had began spontaneously speaking South American tribal languages after participating in a holotropic breathwork session. To Tarrant, this just sounded ridiculous, but he had to see for himself. After the breathwork sessions where the languages started to emerge, Janet claimed that she learned how to access this ability simply by shifting her awareness. Of course, at that point, she wasn't even certain that what she was speaking was a language, but it felt and sounded like a language. The problem was no one seems to recognize it. So in an attempt to understand what was happening, Janet started recording herself during these language experiences. She would send the tapes to professors and researchers all over the U.S. While many experts were polite, they couldn't give her an answer. They had no clue what was going on. But eventually, Janet got into contact with this doctor named Dr. Bernardo Pixoto, and Pixoto was an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution and a shaman that was originally from a tribe in northern Brazil. So Dr. Pixoto indicated that Janet was speaking a real language. It was Yanomami, a South American tribal language. And even though Janet had no idea what she was saying, she always felt like there was special meaning behind the sounds. When her exact words were later translated, they found that these things she was saying were prayers related to honoring Mother Earth. Over time, Dr. Pixoto would go on to translate several tapes and reported that Janet sometimes spoke other South American tribal dialects as well. Janet knew that Jeff Tarrant conducted EEG brain imaging, so they decided to complete a series of experiments with Jeff Tarrant being a skeptic, and they were going to measure what was happening in her brain while she was allowing these languages to come through. So one of the first things that Tarrant noticed was that when Janet would speak, there was a significant change in the EEG signals coming from the sensor locations and the back right quadrant of her brain. Similar to Tyler Henry, instead of the normal, nice, neat patterns that he expected to see, Janet's brain signals were jumping off of the charts, and they almost looked like seizure activity. After double and triple checking his equipment, Tarrant found the same change in activity on several testing occasions, and he simply had to accept that something dramatic was happening in Janet's brain that he couldn't explain. So this right quadrant in Janet's brain that had all this activity was later determined to be the right parietal lobe. And this part of the brain has a specific purpose according to neuroscientists. It's involved in defining and perceiving the self, self-related thoughts, perception of the body, and autobiographical memory or memory of the self. Basically, when this part of the brain is doing its job, it helps create an understanding of the self as being a separate and discrete entity associated with the definition of me. In turn, if this area is damaged, people can have a really poor idea recognizing themselves. They can have derealization. With Janet, she was having these intense feelings of spiritual transcendence, and she had this softening boundary of her sense of self. Somehow it appeared that Janet was able to temporally disrupt the functioning of her right parietal lobe, presumably allowing her to make a shift in her consciousness in a way that some would claim allowed other forms of consciousness to speak through her. Others who have had these experiences see it as a special, higher connection to the universe, a spiritual or a paranormal phenomena, a gift, or something in our subconscious where we pick up information without our conscious mind realizing it. Premonition dreams could be a spiritual channel, a form of piercing the veil, because our bodies and minds are more relaxed when we're sleeping. They're more vulnerable and able to tune in to something else. We will likely never know what is causing these seemingly extraordinary cases of premonition, but I certainly am thankful for whatever it is, honestly. Should you experience precognition, I would encourage you to lean in, listen to that gut instinct, 
And that, everybody, is the premonition concept, precognition, and psychic abilities. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed researching it and telling it. If you did enjoy, be sure to let me know. Uh, before I was a content creator, I really didn't think about leaving five-star reviews or hitting the subscribe button. I didn't really see why that mattered, but guys, I can't emphasize enough how much that helps the show. So if you haven't done so yet and you enjoyed, you want to keep up, it really would mean a lot if you would hit the subscribe button on YouTube and on a podcast platform. I would love it if you leave a five-star review. On Apple, you can write reviews. You can also drop a comment on YouTube or Spotify for this exact episode. Let me know what you thought about it. Uh, let me know if you have had a premonition before. I definitely want to hear about that. And you can always, with that in mind, send listener stories. Email those to perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. If you have had a premonition, if you feel like you have some kind of psychic ability, or if you've had crazy deja vu, I want to hear about it. And if you really want to support the show, you can check out the support links down in the episode description, like my merch links, my buy me a coffee link. And if you want bonus content too, go check out the Patreon. There's tons of tiers you can check out. There's lots of benefits to joining. And because I do not qualify for any type of ad revenue, any type of monetization, this podcast is completely funded by myself and by you guys. So joining the Patreon really helps. Everybody, don't forget, save the date. Virtual live show coming to you Saturday, July 13th, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube live. Be there or be square. We're going to have a great time. And yeah, I'm just super looking forward to it. You all are amazing. I hope you have a great week and stay safe. And I will talk to you next week. Bye.